Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of our Growth Fit interview series brought to you by Custom Fit AI. My name is Ashwini. I am the growth engineer at Custom Fit AI. Custom Fit AI helps you helps B2B companies to convert website traffic into quality leads by dynamically changing website content and CTAs based on user persona and past behaviors. It's a no-code platform for marketers to dynamically create hyper personalized experiences to lift their conversions. Our today's guest is Madhav Vandari. Welcome Madhav and thank you so much for joining us here. Great to be here. Thanks a lot. Madhav is uh, currently working with Bonsai as a marketing head. He's also founder of uh, Remote uh, Remote Marketing. Uh, if I'm not wrong Madhav, right? Yes, yes, correct. Yeah. So let's just dive in today marketing tips from Madhav. Awesome. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, first, first, I I want to understand about your journey, like uh, from management trainee to uh, at uh, Touch Techno uh, to marketing head uh, in Bonsai. So, how you started? What all challenges you faced, and uh, how did you overcome them to reach to this position? Yeah. <laughs> so you're basically asking like almost a decade of my, like my entire <laughs> work, uh, work yeah. history. So uh, I think to kind of like, just to kind of give a very short story to kind of keep this in under a minute is, uh, yeah, I mean, like I've always been very entrepreneurial, uh, even in college. So, you know, when I kind of got out of college, it was like, you know, I didn't want to kind of be with like, you know, a big company, whether, you know, their processes and creative blockers and stuff like that. So like the first two years, like Touch Techno and Clinchpad, uh, you know, these were all kind of like um, companies where I was kind of like a founding member and we were trying to build a product and we did raise funding and we did get, you know, users and, you know, a lot of revenue. Um, but, you know, at that point it was just, you know, understanding how, you know, like it, it was all a starting point for me, right? So probably a little early in kind of like the founding stage. So from there, um, I basically got an opportunity to join a company called Hubstaff, which was kind of at, um, you know, at, at like a slightly more advanced stage in terms of post-product market fit. And, uh, and and I was invited to kind of lead the marketing there. So I was kind of employee number three there, joined the company at about 200,000 annually in, in revenue. And then, um, you know, I was there for about four years. We grew the company to about 5 million. Um, and, oh, you know, right now it's, it's making about 15 million. So, uh, you know, that was where I basically kind of got through kind of like really what the, you know, what does it take to kind of, you know, take through kind of like all of these different stages uh, of the revenue funnel for a business. And then, yeah, and then and through that experience, it was just uh, blogging my learnings and, and through those, um, through kind of like sharing all of my work online, I got connected with, you know, the, the, the next couple of companies, you know, be it Close.io or Bonsai and kind of got those marketing leadership roles. So I think that hopefully summarizes uh, what I did. So when you started, it it, it was, uh, you started from scratch, right? Uh, at, in Hubstaff and, and yeah. also in other companies. Uh, I mean, every company was at a different, different phase. Um, you know, like for example, a clinch pad, touch techno, you know, pre-product market fit, Hub stuff, post product market fit. Um, close was uh, was at a you know pretty high revenue scale, so you know that was a different channel uh, challenge. So it was all at different different revenue uh, timelines, but yeah. So and Hub stuff, it was yes, it was it was at a very early stage. And uh, can you share something about your uh, own company, Remote Marketing? uh like how what problems you solve and uh, uh what is going on in your marketing team right now yeah yeah so bonsai is basically um you know it's a it's a software for freelancers to kind of run their business uh we help them you know remove the boring admin work with freelancing um and help them look more professional for clients um and yeah that's that's the mission like you know, it's used by 300,000 plus freelancers and all of that. Um, remote marketing, on the other hand, has been my personal side project for about five years now. Um, and it was really just this, you know, I was talking about, you know, um, I've, 
you know, for like almost eight years now, we've worked with a hundred percent remote teams, led, built like these global international remote marketing teams. Yeah. So I had like a little different perspective on like, um, you know, like building out these marketing teams and building out a growth engine. So it was just me kind of sharing learnings through the blog. And then I connected with a bunch of people, started doing interviews, created these different forms of content. And then basically it became like a big resource hub um, for anyone, uh, yeah. you know, that's, that's especially true. in the B2B SaaS world. And uh, you were in this mar- uh, like remote marketing since eight years. So how do you feel like uh, this remote marketing, uh, sorry, remote working is trending now, like after pandemic, but you have, I think some, some other thought in your mind when you started as long back, right? Yeah, I mean, the remote working thing kind of came, obviously became a lot more popular in the last two years, and it was kind of like a forced change. Um, at that time, it was it was just by accident, you know, like, uh, you know, I was working partially remote with, you know, some, like with some of my, you know, teammates at, at Clinchpad and all, and we were just kind of collaborating remotely. And so at that time, we didn't even know, oh, you know, it's, it's remote working. It was just the way we worked. Um, and then kind of like this whole hundred percent remote team started becoming more and more popular. Popular. Uh, yeah. And so that, that's why, like, it, it's like, the thing is that remote working's also been there since 2003, you know, you used to have satellite workers, um, especially in tech that used to work. So it's just the, the trends kind of catching up and I'm glad it's catching up, but, uh, yeah, it's just, it's been there for a long time. And I, I'm I'm really curious, Madhav, uh, to know about your uh, journey uh, from 100k dollar to ARR to 10 million dollar ARR. So your uh, your contribution in this commendable growth. Yeah, um, it, I I don't think in in any way. Whenever we talk about growth journeys, it's not like I obviously helped in that, but there's the contribution of the entire team. Everyone has contributed in their own way. My contribution has basically come, uh, uh, you know, from the, like, you know, I am, I, I'd say I got about 80% of the results on kind of like top of the funnel where basically demand gen, you know, kind of like increasing our demand, increasing our awareness, increasing the number of signups, increasing the top of the funnel. Um, yes, I've worked on some, you know, retention and, and you know, churn and, and conversion projects, but it's primarily been the demand gen side. So, yeah, and so my work has primarily been how do we kind of scale that top of the funnel, bring in, you know, a large amount of customers, because a lot of companies I've worked with were product-led, uh, you know, with a, with a low LTV. Uh, so it required us to be innovative, be in a little bit more cost-effective way. Uh, and get like huge volumes of users. So yeah, that's that's been my contribution. Great. Uh, so can you uh, emphasize some uh, points regarding like top, uh, this is the five points you must understand and you must be uh, bounded with if you're a marketer and in if you're in demand gen. So top five points you need to consider, you must consider according to you. Yeah, so I, I think one thing that, that was kind of like a very big learning, 100K to 10 million is that, you know, things change so rapidly from revenue milestones, you know. Uh, the marketing strategy is very different at 100. Like, for example, at 100K to a million, it was basically, you know, like trying out like 300 different marketing tactics and, and just figuring out which are the marketing tactics that actually work. And then those can become like the foundational channels, right? So it's more of lots of testing out different channels, figuring out what works for you and find that foundational channel, which you can mature it on, right? Uh, and, and you can build on top of that. Um, and then, you know, from one to three, three to five, all of these different revenue milestones have different challenges. Sometimes, uh, you know, the, the channel caps out, there's not a lot of room for growth. Uh, sometimes the traffic, you know, you know, it kind of is flat and you can't do anything about it. Sometimes the product's LTV is kind of a limiting factor for the marketing team to not be able to kind of expand. Um, there are all sorts of different challenges and then you just have to find different ways to kind of do that. Sometimes it's even um, a channel grows to a point, a marketing channel grows to a point where it just requires 
very deep expertise, uh, much more like a hundred times more specialized person than you can do that work. So you, then you need to kind of build like a more specialized team, you know, within that mature channel and everything. So I think that's one thing that at every revenue, like for example, and the reason why I'm saying this is because sometimes, you know, you might see some articles, so, oh, you know, Slack did this and they grew from here and there, right? Slack is whatever at 300, 500 million dollars. Do, I mean, it's probably not relevant to you if you're at like at a 1 million revenue milestone, right? So look at that um, for sure. And then I guess the second thing on the demand gen side is that when you're kind of um, tackling, you know, the whole strategic work on this, right? Always kind of look at, you know, like what's the price point of your product, right? Like let's say, for example, um, if your product is 100K annually, right? That's a that's a very very high price point. So it's not like someone will kind of click a link on your article and sign up to your product. That's not going to happen with a hundred k product. It might happen with a hundred two hundred dollars. Um, you know, in the entire NTV, you know, that kind of product that works. You know, and so for that we use these okay. terms called high touch. So a hundred k product is is a very high touch product because it requires salespeople to kind of come in and you know a long sales cycle a complex sales cycle while with a hundred two hundred dollars product it's low touch you sign up you know for the product trial it if you like it you'll buy it um and based on that you need to kind of figure out what the strategy makes sense like for example events might make sense with a hundred k sales a hundred k product just because if you get two leads if there's a create ROI from the event. But if your you know, LTV is 100, 200 events wouldn't make sense. But you know, on the other hand, SEO might make a lot of sense there because there's a lot of volume for a low size. So I mean, I guess you need to kind of look at you know, the business model and then, and then define and decide like how you kind of want to build out your demand gen strategy. So uh, as you mentioned about SEO, what are some SEO hacks uh, you would like to share with our fellow marketers out there? Basically, scale your SEO. Yeah, there are no hacks to SEO. At least I don't believe that. Uh, it's fairly simple. There are three components to it. You just need to do it really well. One is kind of um, create great content that solves problems of your customers. Second is your content experience, like how fast the page loads, how quickly do they get the valuable information and everything and number three is link per link these three things if you do really well uh there's a ton of content out there i don't think there's any hack that oh you know you do these things and th there's no magic bullet in seo you just gotta do these three things really well and oh what is that one mantra you believe a content marketer must follow um ask a lot of questions be very inquisitive um you know ask questions from you know prospective customers from people who don't even want to try a product who want to try a product ask questions from the leadership team ask questions from everybody just kind of like i think that's that's the thing you know because uh, when you ask questions you you know come up with a lot of breakthrough ideas and um, and the thing with breakthrough ideas is if you through a question get this great idea you've basically gotten this idea before everybody's kind of utilized it and used it to the max right so you have uh you know an early uh advantage so yeah just ask a lot of questions be inquisitive keep looking at your analytics data to understand you know oh you know you're getting a lot of users from this particular country why is that you know ask those questions ask those people like why are you signing up what triggered you to sign up that's really going to help you uh really uh, uh mature as a content marketer Definitely, definitely. And in your content plan and strategy, how do you uh, include personalization and how uh, far is it useful for you? Um, I'm not, I don't like, so at least from the personalization that I saw today, kind of uh, earlier today, right? Like we don't do that kind of personalization yet, but it's uh, our kind of personalization, basically this, right? That there's a certain um there's a certain topic that works very well for us like i mean there's a audience there that that uses our product and so within that there are lots of subtopics and and you know different things and so the way we've basically done it is um uh yeah we just cover every aspect of it you know through different verticals um for example um you know a, a simple example is you know how to create a contract right so 
um, you know, if you kind of look at the top to the bottom of the funnel journey, right? The the way I define it is uh, problem unaware, problem aware, uh, solution aware, product aware, right? And if you're to tackle each of these, you know, it can be how to create a contract for, uh, you know, for marketers, uh, what's the best contract making software for marketers, um, you know, and, uh, you know, which out of these three tools is the best contract making software. And through that, you know, we can go with specific verticals and like really scale it. Uh, that's, that's the level of personalization we go with because in like, uh, like in, in our experience, like, I think with when we kind of do any kind of personalization, uh, I think it can definitely have a big impact, you know, especially, you know, like changing the name or the company name in kind of like the sign up page and all. I think that can have an impact, but I don't think it can have a very meaningful impact. Uh, you know, like it can probably increase our conversions from maybe like 1.1 to maybe 1.25% or something, but not huge. The real value of personalization comes is when you can kind of, you know, give the right information to the right visitor at the right time. So what I mean by that is um, if there's a marketer or if there's a developer that's coming to your website to try the product, they should only see developer related testimonials. They should only see, you know, developer related copy. They should only see developer related features. They should only see that language. And that's when you know they'll be like, oh my God, this product is really meant for me, right? Um, and that's something we're yet to do because, uh, yeah, I mean, like I've done that before at at Hubstaff. We did a lot of personalization there, but at Bonsai, uh, it's not done too much. That's that's really like uh, maybe valuable in this world. So nobody uh, particularly talks about it. So you must know about these things. I I would say, um, yeah. Coming to the next question. So uh, you did uh, host many podcasts, right? So, uh, how do you feel at opposite side of as a, uh, of it, like as a speaker? So uh, which one is your favorite as a speaker or as a host and the reason behind it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, first of all, um, it's the same because uh, the remote marketing podcast that in case you know if any of your listeners don't know the podcast name is actually called remote marketing podcast it's on spotify apple and uh and google and, and all other places but on the podcast i have more episodes of me just talking to the audience versus interviewing people right um so I, i'm sometimes a listener sometimes a, a speaker so it's kind of the same for me but my favorite podcast episode was uh was actually um, this guy called Sanchar Sahin, uh, who is basically the former VP of marketing at Typeform, uh, you know, former VP of marketing at Hardjar and GetApp, and he's got his own startup now. And it was almost like a marketing leadership uh, masterclass because, uh, you know, the way he kind of described his perspective, like really got me thinking and like, oh, you know, this is something that I should like at at my core of the way I function as a marketing leader i should i should probably modify uh, and it was such a inf insightful interview that a couple of months later um you know sancha and i actually like he became my mentor and we've been working together ever since you know we we discuss complex challenges and stuff like that um and it's been one of the best decisions i've taken so yeah that that by far definitely i mean all podcast guests were amazing and everyone had their own value but i guess the one that really hit home for me was was the one with sancha Got it, got it. And um, I am coming to the pandemic situation. Like we faced a lot of uh, things since 2020, uh, from the start of 2020, and this is almost one and a half year. So our lives has changed and transformed a lot. So uh, how bonsai? Uh, when you when you also joined bonsai, it was uh, again a pandemic situation. So what was the case that time, and how did you uh, did you uh, face any challenges in the situation, and how how did you overcome them, or a B two B SaaS company? Yeah, so it was a little bit of a uh, you know, obviously, you know, we came to a situation where nobody knew you know what to kind of do here uh because i think uh every business definitely at that, that one month like march april 
uh, there were a lot of you know very high churn, lots of cancellations, people just pausing their accounts and stuff. Um, so that was a little bit of a shock. Um, but I think and that's that's where it's very important to kind of have your you know a business economics quite right. Like we were, you know, we are a profitable company, so it's like um, you know it, it wasn't like that. Oh, you know, our, our our bank balance was getting massively affected. Like we had a runway for years. Um, but the one thing that we wanted to do was that um, we wanted to make sure that we cut as many costs as possible without having to let go of anyone. Um, and one of the things, there are two major things that we did. One was that, like for example, ads budget and all of that, you know, we, we drastically cut those. Uh, any unprofitable initiatives, we cut those. But the one thing that actually worked in our favor is that we're actually huge believers of kind of um, wherever possible, we try to kind of first have, um, you know, hire a freelancer or a contractor or an agency versus a full-time employee because the thing is that a freelancer contractor is a is a variable cost versus a full-time employee that's a fixed cost. So with an agency or freelancer, that can be scaled down when we, uh, uh, you know, whenever we whenever we want to. But uh, a, a full-time employee, we can't we can't just let go, right? So with agencies, freelancers, we kind of paused our contracts. That really helped us reduce the costs. But I think the good thing with our business was that, um, you know. It was it was a very temporary hit, and then we actually saw a pretty amazing growth, you know, a month later. And that's primarily because it kind of worked in our favor that um, because a lot of people were kind of um, you know let go, a lot of them actually converted to freelancers and became contractors and stuff. And they started as a result started using our product, right? So in that way, it helped us, you know, kind of grow you know, in a, in a, in a record setting way in 2020. So that definitely worked in our favor, but from a marketing standpoint, that was, that was one of the things we did. We cut our costs, you know, whatever was profitable, very heavily profitable, only that stayed, um, cut out any variable cost that we had that, that, worked, that didn't make any sense. And then, yeah, it was just uh, constant iterating, seeing how the situation goes and, and that, and, and I think that's the thing with any good core marketing strategy, right? Like, there's always going to be pandemics that's going to hit down. It's going to affect your revenue and everything, right? But if the foundation kind of is kind of, you know, is is pretty solid, like pandemic or no pandemic, it's probably just going to have a 10, 20% up and down for you, but you largely kind of still have majority of the revenue Definitely. with you. Uh, so, yeah. And oh, is partnership marketing uh, important for is a part of your lead edition process? Yes, yes. So, um, so for the last one year, I've been working um, on our affiliate program, um, and yeah, it's uh, it's a it's a great channel. Um, the the only thing with partnership marketing or affiliate marketing is that uh, there's very little information that's available, you know, on the internet about it. Like, yes, there's some blogs here and there. But and and the other thing with affiliate marketing is that it's diff it's completely different for every company. So it's not like you can kind of you know copy the same playbook that you know this other similar company is doing and replicate it for you. It's almost like a sub business that you're building within your business because you know every affiliate has their own personalities. They have their own custom flows. You know they have their own you know upgrade paths and stuff like that. So it's a you know it, it's a it's a difficult channel to scale especially because you know partnerships and affiliates are something that they will grow as your brand grows you know because as your brand grows as your branded searches grow of course there's going to be more and more people that are, want to be kind of promoting your product right but if you want to kind of put in additional investment right now to kind of scale that channel um then you know you, you've got to kind of think really creatively you know how can you get you know, a certain number of fillets, you know, guaranteed every month to sign up and start promoting you. A lot of it is just very, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I guess th that's kind of like my perspective on partnerships marketing so far. And uh, as you said, affiliate marketing uh, helps in uh, building your online presence. So any any other effective, most effective way uh, you will recommend to increase your brand's online presence? Yeah, affiliates is actually an amazing way to kind of improve your brand's presence because, uh, you know, here's the thing, right? Like when I'm kind of purchasing a product, I never go to a company's website and read their case study or testimonials because I know that it's 
it's always going to be biased, right? The company is writing that case study. How can it not be? Um, but you know, when I see a user's review or a case study about the product, then it's like it's it's an unbiased thing, right? And I'm that will heavily you know influence the way I purchase, right? Um, and if you have lots and lots of like you know, if let's say you know someone goes on YouTube and and searches for I don't know intercom reviews, and there's a gazillion number of users that have done their reviews, yeah, that's a huge indicator for the brand, you know, that oh you know this is a product that a lot of people love and they a lot of people talk about and use. Um, so affiliates is actually a great contributor to the brand's uh, side there. Um, there's obviously a lot of different ways to do it or to kind of improve your brand presence, but I guess the number one thing you should be kind of thinking about is how can you be a topical authority uh, in an area where you have a very unique positioning, right? Like for example, a simple example is that, uh, you know, if let's say, I don't know your market, but let's say if you have 50 personalization apps in the market, right? And everyone's kind of talking about, you know, whatever, personalization, everything. Um, as a user, I'm like, you know, oh, well, why would I want to kind of subscribe to custom fit? Like what, what makes you guys different? Um, but if let's say you're like, oh, you know, we just talk about personalization, you know, for SaaS companies in the B2B space, you know, with an LTV of under 500, now you've got my interest because now you're a product led focus then and, and you are different from the other personalization companies, right? And that's that's the thing, you know, if you can build that topical authority around this unique positioning, that's the, that's a sure short way to kind of improve your brand presence. It's gonna and and the best way to measure that is just just look at your branded traffic on search console or analytics and you'll see a start a, a, a slow increasing trend. And you've really got to invest on the content and SEO. Like one of the things that's great that you guys are doing with this growth fit interview series is you're you're it seems clear that you know marketers are something that that work for you. So you're talking to a lot of people and gathering all of these insights. That's a great start. Um and I think that's what makes you different from the other one. So I guess that's the main thing with brand. Like you need to have that topical authority with a unique positioning. That's that's a great learning for us too, Madhav. Like we we get to learn uh at least four to five things uh speaking to others speaking to veterans speaking to uh, even even fellow marketers can give us a feedback about uh what what uh, this this thing didn't work even uh some of my friends uh see this uh interview series and they they also give feedback this was good this was not good so you can work on this so th this is a great learning for us too i would say and, oh, absolutely. And this this improves and, you. Yeah, yeah. And just to kind of give a <laughs> um, like a, a a little like a little bit of a honest opinion on this, right? Like, I think the whole the reason I kind of even started my own podcast was not just kind of sharing my learnings, but also like mm -hmm. if there's a channel that you don't have an idea about the best way to know it is to talk to the people who are doing it, right? And that, like, in every episode that I've done, you know, with yeah. guests, there's always these tremendous learnings that come, you know, which compounded over time can, you know, become this huge, amazing playbook that you can follow, right? And that's why, you know, earlier on into the interview, I said, you know, it's the best way to grow as a content marketer, even as a business heavy, it's just to be inquisitive, ask questions, talk to as many people, get people on the phone, in however way as possible and collect that information. Um, so yeah, it, 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 yeah, I, I agree with you. And uh, when when all this content, uh, SEO, uh, affiliate marketing, uh, this this all comes in picture. I I, I can say uh, I can see one part which is most important that is data. So. Uh, what is your take about data like how it is important and what is your secret formula in designing a campaign uh, and what all things you consider the what all data points you consider in designing a campaign yeah i mean uh, it varies for business to business like again um, with a low touch saas the number one thing that you care about is number of new customers new signups and everything right and that defines why you know how you kind of do the campaigns um and if it's a high touch SaaS, it's really the number of quality leads that you can kind of pass over to the sales team those are kind of like the major numbers that define and then it obviously changes a little bit like for example with paid ads i can give you an example um 
you know, we, we obviously, you know, have a large advertising budget can be spend it on a lot of different channels, but let's say we want to kind of expand and look at other channels, for example, YouTube or Reddit, right? Um, one of the things that we do there, um, you know, as a starting point to kind of test for the channel and use data is um, we, we will basically, you know, spend money and gather the data. We like to say it as buy the data uh, and understand is there even some potential? So let's say we put $8,000 on YouTube and then, uh, and then, you know, do we get even one or two conversions? If not, if we just get zero conversions, that means there's no direct ROI on that, right? And then, you know, we can kind of, uh, you know, take some decisions. The same thing is, you know, with, with content stuff, right? Like for example, if there are certain articles that are performing better than others, right? It can kind of give us an indication that Perhaps that's a topic that Google is really valuing us for. So we're going to create more content there, doubling down on what works basically. Um, and then, you know, if there's a if there's an article that got us a lot of backlinks or virality, again, you know, the data will say that, oh, you know, you've got 300 backlinks there, you've got this, you know, it's it's having a positive impact on your SEO and stuff. We're going to double down on it and create more and more pieces. So absolutely, like data is definitely at the center of all those decisions. But eventually, like you know, the, the number one metric you really just care about is signups, high quality leads, new customers, right? That's that's the major thing. The more you kind of start going up the funnel, the more metrics start becoming uh, vanity metrics. And that's something you should remember, uh, for sure. And um, which one is your favorite, paid one or organic one? Oh, man, that's a difficult one. Because the thing <laughs> is that, I mean, I want to like it's a it's a difficult question to answer because it's like I I ideally I want it's a, okay so the answer is new customers absolutely like that's the number one metric there but the thing is that I think as you kind of start maturing as you start kind of growing the business to certain revenue milestones it's easier to attribute revenue to certain channels in the initial stages of your journey. But I think beyond that, you have to kind of look at it large scale, right? Um, you don't have to look at the, oh, you know, I invested this much money on this campaign for the three months. So I need to get an ROI in the next three months. You need to kind of look at things two years later where there's no attributable impact there because you need to start looking at things on a more account level, on a more company level that, all right, you know, are the unit economics the same across the company level? That's what you care about. So anyway, short answer to this number of new customers. And uh, coming to uh, the last two questions of our episode. So uh, first one is, what is that one advice which is the most important to you, a fellow marketer uh, must understand? Uh, any any kind of uh, that one advice you would like to give to our fellow marketers? Um, I think there's a couple. So, um, okay. Uh, yeah. Please. I think the... <laughs> The the number one thing, and that was the number one learning that that I've had the, the last couple of years is that uh, if you're a marketing lead at a company, um, or even if you're kind of like a founder or a CMO, um, when you think about marketing, think of it like a investment portfolio, all right? Uh, and every channel is is all of these, you know, um, these you know, these these things in your portfolio. And what you're basically looking to find is uh, the one with the lowest risk and the highest return, right? Um, and based on that, you define how you kind of spend. So for example, if SEO is, you know, is relatively low risk because you've talked to other founders and you've found that it works for, for them. And if it's working for you, um, you should start investing more and more and more in that and continue to monitor if the unit economics remain the same or continue to be better because then it shows does a channel have the ability to absorb the investment right uh and that's that's the thing you should look at across the portfolio overall you know like um even as you kind of grow two years three years if once you cross five million ten million that's the thing you should keep looking at like what does your portfolio look like how is your budget being spent here and there? What do the unit economics look like? And which are kind of like the dominant secondary channels? How do the company level unit economics look like? It has to be looked at it like a like you are an investment manager. You're basically defining how you invest that, right? So that's I think that's one thing that's that's a little bit on a 
leadership level level and i guess the second thing on a more tactical level you know is um spend a lot of time doing your own critical thinking all right um because i think um it's very easy to kind of you know this person does the podcast mm-hmm. i do a podcast too right that that won't you know that, that's not copying and pasting can work sometimes but it won't take you very far what you should be looking at is that mm-hmm. you know what are the opportunities out there that none of these people have tried because that's where i'd almost say like this golden um golden period of that channel lives that's where you're the only person who's getting the best amount of you know coverage from there and utilize that to a point where eventually people get to know about it and then you can kind of move on to the next right uh, but it requires you to talk to people talk to customers like a, a simple example is that um you know like uh, like an interesting example is i was kind of speaking to an affiliate um one, one of our leading affiliates and one of the reasons they've been getting a lot of customers is because they write an article on medium and there are like these five or six article uh, sites big media sites that syndicate that content right that is that was a very interesting learning you know you know a, a medium article publisher has been able to get these five six sites to syndicate right and nobody knows about it none of our competitors know about it and everything right so how can you do that how can you do that to a point until you know competitors discover it that'll require you to kind of sit down think make a plan and everything right like so uh, absolutely and i think the more you critically think the more you'll get these breakthrough ideas the more you'll be able to kind of uh get a lot of success in your in your work and so yeah i think uh, that's a learning for me too uh, uh, that's that's a uh, golden two words as critical thinking which is most most important uh in today's era yeah lucky uh, who all are your mentors in this marketing and growth sector um so i have mentors for kind of different different mentor coach for like different different aspects right like um i already told you sanchar is kind of like my mentor with strategic marketing work um and you know then i of course have like a group of people who i connect with you know if there is a certain problem for a certain channel these are all people of previously worked with or connected with through some other way um and then i have uh, you know a, a different coach which is just kind of you know sometimes these leadership roles can be a little bit stressful so you need a, a stress coach to kind of uh be able to kind of tackle those situations so i have a coach for that so it's it's different different for different scenarios but yeah well uh, thank you so much madhav like right? this this was a, a really uh knowledgeable session for us and uh, this must be a uh, knowledgeable session for everyone who will be watching this session thank you so much everyone for joining us here in growth fit interview series have a great day hi thanks a lot